We all know how Intel's new platform launch went. It was very, very disappointing, but it hasn't stopped me from thinking about this one question that has been plaguing my mind. Can ITX save Intel's new platform? Can an ITX motherboard with a bunch of features make it for a more compelling choice. Before you answer the question in the comments saying no, I think there's something very interesting going on here with these boards. So let's check out both the ASRock Z890i Nova and the new MSI Edge Ti just to see what's going on because some of these features are something we haven't really seen on ITX boards. Let's dive in. Before we begin, if you're wondering why I didn't include the Z890 Aorus Ultra, it's because the feature set, even the rear I.O. alone, is nowhere near on parity with either the ASRock or the MSI boards that we're going to be checking out in this video. In fact, it's only got two M.2 slots, whereas both the MSI and ASRock board have more than two, as you're about to find out. But first things first, Let's take a look at the ASRock Nova because this one here is one that might be interesting if you want to save a couple bucks on an ITX board. What ASRock is doing here is following a formula. This is what most ITX boards do. They'll have most of the motherboard headers on the right hand edge of the board. And for the Nova, it is pretty clear that some things have been taken away. Say for instance, there's only two SATA ports. Some ITX boards had four, but now two is becoming the standard. But all of these new boards are PCIe Gen 5 by 16 with their PCIe slot. And because this is an Intel board for this new Core Ultra series of processors, it does have the LGA 1851 socket. As for the VRM layout on the Nova Wi-Fi, it's a 12 plus one plus one plus one plus one phase VRM layout with 110 amp Dr. Moss smart power stages with a 10 layer PCB. The VRM layout on the Nova Wi-Fi is actively cooled. There's a heat pipe that connects both the heatsink from the IO cover to the heatsink at the top, but underneath the IO cover, you'll notice there is a cutout. There's three cutouts rather, and there's a fan behind that, and that does actively cool the VRM and all of the components underneath the IO cover. As for memory, the Nova Wi-Fi will allow you to install two DDR5 DIMM modules with up to a total of 128 gigs of memory at 9866 mega transfers overclocked. That is the highest it will go, but whether or not it'll do that is a different story. Flipping the Nova Wi-Fi over, you'll see that there's a backplate. It doesn't cover the whole thing, but it does help with heat transfer on the backside of the motherboard. Curiously enough, there's two things that you might notice as well, taking a bit of a closer look. There's two M.2 connectors, which I'll come back to in a moment because the storage on this board is more in line with what we'd see for a full ATX board, not an ITX board. Hmm. Okay, anyway, let's take off the M.2 heatsink on the top of the board because this will reveal the first M.2 slot. There's a single PCIe Gen 5x4 M.2 slot on the top side of the board underneath that heatsink. And going back to the other side of the board, there's two more PCIe Gen 4x4 M.2 slots, meaning there's three M.2 slots on an ITX motherboard. Very interesting stuff here. As for rear IO on the Nova Wi-Fi, there are six USB type A ports. All of these are 10 gigabit ports. There's two Thunderbolt 4 ports. This will allow you to install backwards compatible Thunderbolt 3 devices, as well as an HDMI 2.1 port. There's also the five gigabit ethernet, which is another reason why we didn't include the Oris board. And there's Wi-Fi 7, there's a BIOS flashback button. There's a microphone input, a headphone output, and optical slash SPDIF output for audio. As you can see here, the IO is quite stacked for an ITX board, but where this gets more interesting is with the MSI board, with the Edge TI Wi-Fi, because the MSI board is even more stacked. Unlike ASRock, MSI has taken a bit of a different approach to motherboard headers. They're kind of taking a leaf out of ASUS's book here that we've seen with other ASUS boards because 
what they're doing is they've got a slot for all of the IO to be slotted in on a separate card. Well, not all of it, some of it. Allow me to explain this a little bit better. Essentially what it is, is there is this add-in card. It gives you two SATA ports. It gives you a USB type C port header with 27 watt PD charging. How this works is it slots into that slot on the motherboard and gives you access to all of these headers. You'll also notice there's a USB type C connector. There's a cable that comes with the board that gives you another USB 3.2 connector. And that just basically plugs in like any other USB cable would plug in. Like all boards in this generation, there's a single PCIe slot, which is a PCIe Gen 5 slot. This is a full by 16 size slot here. And once again, because this supports Intel Core Ultra Series 2 processors, it does have the LGA 1851 socket. But for VRM layout, this board features a 10 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 phase VRM layout with 110 amp smart power stages with a 14 layer PCB. This VRM layout is also actively cooled. There's a fan underneath the IO cover. The cutout here is quite obvious on the top of the IO cover. And then there's a heat pipe that connects both of the heat sinks together for an actively cooled solution. As for the memory configuration, it's got two DDR5 DIMM slots, which will support up to a total of 128 gigs of RAM at 8,600 mega transfers. However, the most interesting thing about this board is none of that, it's the storage once again. This has a mezzanine card, kind of what we see with ASUS boards. And if we flip that mezzanine card over, you'll notice there's another M.2 slot. So, so far we've got two M.2 slots. There's a PCIe Gen 5 by four slot on this card, as well as a PCIe Gen 4 slot. And the way this is connected is with these little connectors here. These are similar to what we see on ASUS boards with their mezzanine cards. And this gives us, again, two M.2 slots, all right? You following? But if we flip the board over, there's another M.2 slot. You might be saying, doesn't it say that there's four M.2 slots? Well, there is. The last M.2 slot is hiding on the back of that card that we showed a little bit earlier that has all the motherboard headers with another PCIe Gen 4 by 4 M.2 slot, totaling four slots on an ITX board, which is absolutely insane. But it doesn't stop there with the HDMI Wi-Fi. There's seven USB type A ports. There's two Thunderbolt 4 ports. There's a single 10 gig USB type C port. We've got the antenna connectors for the built-in Wi-Fi 7, HDMI 2.1, a BIOS flashback button, a clear CMOS button, a smart button, headphone and microphone jack, as well as optical slash SPDIF output for your audio. And once again, five gigabit ethernet. There's a few takeaways from both the ASRock and the MSI board here. The MSI board having active VRM cooling, the ASRock board also has this, although it's not as obvious with the VRM cooling here. As you can see on the MSI board, it does have a cutout, whereas the ASRock board is a bit less noticeable, but it does have active cooling. It's something that you may miss. As well as that, both of these boards have five gigabit ethernet and two Thunderbolt 4 ports, which is not the case for every Z890 ITX board. The rear IO alone on both of these boards make both of these boards some of the most compelling ITX boards that we've ever seen. You could ask and say, hey, how come they didn't go one step further and do things like 10 gigabit ethernet? There's a couple reasons. First of all, there'd have to be additional cooling. 10 gigabit ethernet controllers typically get quite hot. I can see this changing in the future with more optimizations to those 10 gig controllers. As well as that, you might be wondering, where is the ASUS ROG board? That's a really good question. I have no idea. I guess the major takeaway from looking at both of these boards is really not an issue with the feature set of these boards at all. That's not the problem here. The main issue I have with this new Intel platform is it's a pretty disappointing platform performance wise. And we have so many Z890 boards here to cover that. I don't feel that excited about this platform at all, but I wanted to find an interesting way to kind of look at these boards for more than what the platform is and more about the feature set of what we're finding 
with these new Z890 boards. It could be argued that the ATX boards are kind of boring, but what I found with these ITX boards is they've packed quite a lot into what you would typically find. Take for instance, the Z890 Aorus board that we looked at just before the new platform came out. That one I thought was interesting, but after doing a quick comparison, and I think I mentioned this earlier in the video, it wasn't even worth including in this video because these boards pack so many more features. Both of these boards have dual Thunderbolt. Both of these boards have five gigabit ethernet. And that alone to me, for someone who creates content and likes really large feature sets, makes both of these boards worth looking at. Now, again, politics aside, we know the performance for this new Intel platform is mediocre. And Intel has made some really strange changes to their fundamental architecture. Removing hyperthreading, for me personally, is a step going backwards. I understand why they would do such a thing for efficiency and kind of pulling it more in line with Lunar Lake and their laptop platforms, but for me personally, this is a desktop platform. Don't take away something that we've had for such a long time. I get that the cost of energy in most regions is really expensive and it's really expensive here, but for the enthusiast who wants high performance, don't take away something that we've already had. It doesn't make sense to me. So I guess the most interesting thing about these boards is the price, because in terms of ITX boards, and given what we've seen with the history of ITX boards over the last few years, you're getting more features than we've ever seen at a price that is kind of on parity with what we've seen with previous generations. But the most interesting thing for me is after going to MSI and seeing how the boards were made and kind of understanding the fundamentals of the way these motherboards are created, I can see why boards kind of cost more now. For instance, this MSI board has a 14 layer PCB. That is 14 individual layers of electronics that don't interfere with each other. The reason why they do that is for signaling reasons like PCIe, also for like the audio controllers and all that kind of stuff. So like there's reasons for it, but surely there's a way for that cost of the production to come down a bit. So yeah, like with, with saying, you know, like it costs more because of this, surely they've been doing it for long enough to make it cheaper and pass the savings on to the end user. But at the end of the day, I don't make the rules. I don't make up what the pricing is gonna be. I would say that I think the ASRock one to me looks really interesting. However, the MSI board has so much storage on it that it's just insane to see for an ITX board. Four M.2 slots, that's crazy guys. If you're interested in the ASRock Z890i Nova Wi-Fi, you're looking at about 299 US dollars. And for the MSI Edge Ti, you're looking at around about 369 US dollars at the time of filming this video. That is even to say, if you're looking at Intel for your next small form factor build, but you know, those that's the answer. However, I think I need to go back to the question that I asked at the start of the video. Can ITX save Intel? Well, Intel at this point. I don't have a good answer to that, mainly because what I see, and it's what I already mentioned, is with the new CPU platform, they're trying to make it more in line with Lunar Lake. So they're putting a lot of these optimizations for power efficiency that you'd find in mobile processors for desktop. And that seems a bit stupid to me. I don't know. So yeah, whether or not it saves the platform having these small form factor boards for really small PCs, with all of the things you'd find in a mobile PC or a laptop or a mini PC, that decision really comes down to whether or not you think it's worth it. Do you think that ITX can save Intel? Let us know in the comments down below.